for coming out. Uh, my name is Patrice Keith, and I am the um, founder and executive director of the Santa Cruz Children's Museum of Discovery in Capitola Mall. In case you haven't been there, come visit. Um, look for me. Just come and say hi. Uh, we're open all the time, 10 to 5 every day. And Wednesday, not to you know, flip the crowd over too much, but Wednesday is grandparents' day. <laughs> grandparents get in free. So, um, we're really happy to partner with the library putting on these lectures. We've been doing it for five years and have had some amazing speakers and we're looking forward to this evening. Um, before, well, there's a, a wonderful table set out by the library um, with books that um, you can look at. And then we have museum brochures back there. And then surveys, if you wouldn't mind filling out of other topics that you would like to have us cover. Um, I want to talk about next month. We do. Every, we have a lecture every first Thursday from 6.30 to 8. Always free. Um, next we'll be exploring Pluto, Charon, and the outer reaches of the solar system. Um, Thursday, April 4th, uh, Professor Nemo, uh, the Earth and Planetary Sciences at UCSC. Is that should be a really, did I say the wrong name? No, that's a good name. <laughs> That's what? It's a good name. Good name. Okay. Great. Yes. Um, so we look forward to having you come to that. And we do want to capture your ideas for future lectures, so please do that. And you can also write to me at the museum, and you can write to Brenda at the library, so thank you. Um, let me introduce you to Dr. Tiffany Wise West, the um, Santa Cruz Sustainability and Climate Change Director. More or less, and you're going to tell us a lot more about yourself. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So great to see such a nice turnout tonight. Thank you all for coming out on this evening. Um, I'm Tiffany Wise West. My title is a Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz, and I work in the City Manager's Office. Um, the Climate Action Program. This is our tenth year believe it or not, um, that we've had a climate action program. And I split my time working um, on emissions reduction and climate resilience or climate adaptation. I spend a little bit of my time doing flood control management work also. Um, just real quick background, um, first half of my career, I'm a licensed civil engineer and I did municipal planning and infrastructure kind of work. Um, realized that, um, I wanted to do something more meaningful and uh, went to UCSC and did my PhD in environmental studies and focused on small scale renewable energy um, and got working in this field. So I've been doing this kind of work for about 10 years now um, and really have come to sea level rise and climate adaptation um, from my work at the city of Santa Cruz. So what I'm here to talk to you about today is um, our work to date on sea level rise and a lot more that we have ahead. Um, and I wanna highlight opportunities where you all can be engaged in this work. Um, we've really uh, built into this work always uh, a focus on equity and community participation. So I very much take that to heart. Um, so I'll just give you about a 45 minute uh, talk about what we've been doing, what's ahead. Um, and I wanna leave plenty of time for Q and A uh, questions. So, um, with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So I just want to point out that we have this new logo called Resilient Clo Coast Santa Cruz, and this really embodies the overarching initiative we're trying to do around sea level rise and climate resilience. So if you see this on future pieces of paper or whatnot, or you know, uh, at our website, you'll know that that's um, what we're looking at. I also want to point out at the table over here uh, in the middle, Santa Cruz Climate Action Network uh, is here, who is a great collaborative partner of our program. They have some uh, information about um, emissions reduction and what you can do about that, as well as their sign-up sheet. I also have over there our climate adaptation plan update that was adopted last year, if you want to thumb through it. And I have in the standing kind of holder some this is a terrible name, but practical actions 
for residents for both adaptation and emissions reduction. And I should say that that piece is in revision right now. There is some uh, mention of ice plant in there in a pro way, which is not, not right. So um, that will be posted on our website soon. We're just checking the Spanish language version of that right now before we post it. Hi, Brad. Um, and I also have a sign-up sheet back there. I, if you're interested in learning more about Resilient Coast or being notified about upcoming events, please sign your name. I will not email you about anything else except for Resilient Coast. So if you're interested, please. Um, sign up back there and also I have a little parting gift our little cute stickers so please feel free to take those too um, so uh, I'm gonna talk today just really briefly about our coastal hazards and what we're facing here in Santa Cruz um, what we've done to date uh, in terms of adaptation um, what our coastal vulnerabilities are um, and I have a number of maps to show you about that and then what's ahead, and that includes the uh, Resilient Coast Santa Cruz initiative that um, I mentioned with that logo. I do want to remind folks, you know, while we're very focused today on sea level rise and climate adaptation, it's always necessary to keep in the fore of your mind aggressive reduction of emissions. And so I just want to point out the difference that Sometimes we use the term climate action to really talk about emissions reduction, and climate adaptation is how do we deal with the impacts of climate change. So just terminology I want to make clear. Um, so in Santa Cruz, because of our geography, you know, nestled against the mountains, uh, squeezed against the ocean, we are really subject to a number of climate change hazards uh, here in Santa Cruz. And, this uh, slide really summarizes what those look like. Um, <coughs> excuse me, today of course we're really going to be talking about the coastal hazards and primarily erosion, rising tides, and coastal storm flooding. Um, of course we are working in these other areas right now. Um, we've worked with NOAA on some ocean acidification work. Fortunately, we have no evidence of saltwater intrusion in any of our wells here in Santa Cruz. We do get 95% of our water from the San Lorenzo River and only 5% from wells. And, uh, you know, but we do know that our neighbors next door at Soco Creek do have saltwater intruded um, uh, wells, and so that's something we're watching. And then, of course, we have, um, in terms of non coastal, increased wildfire threat, um, the increased potential of landslide due largely from greater intensity storms, greater frequency of storms, um, drought, uh, increased temperature, which can also affect food supply and availability, fuel supply and availability, as well as impacts to ecosystems and habitats. So what have we done to date? So the city of Santa Cruz was actually one of the first cities to um, develop a climate adaptation plan. So back, started that work back in 2011. Gary Griggs, I'm sure that's a familiar name in the room. He and Professor Brent Haddad, who happened to be my major advisor at UC Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. prepared the city's first vulnerability assessment where we started to characterize the spatial and temporal extent of our uh, the risks that we're facing uh, around sea level rise. And it really was a state-of-the-art plan back in uh, 2012. That was also um, done in parallel with our local hazard mitigation plan. And that is a plan that is approved by California Office of, Envi of uh, Emergency Services as well as FEMA and positions us, makes us eligible for certain hazard mitigation funding. So it's really important to maintain the certification, the every five year certification of the local hazard mitigation plan. So these were developed in parallel and adopted in 2012. So my predecessor, Ross Clark, who might be another familiar name in the room, um, he worked on this and really uh, began to plant the seeds in uh, making adaptation um, a, I'd say almost giving it equally equal footing as emissions reduction as the science was becoming better and better and there were funds available to focus on adaptation work. 
And so with that, I came on board about two and a half years ago, and one of the first things I realized is that our climate adaptation plan and our local hazard mitigation plans needed to be updated. There were new science out, um, there were imperatives like SB 379 that requires vulnerability assessments in LHMPs, and we needed to maintain that certification to be eligible for certain kinds of grants um, from FEMA. And so in 26, end of 2016, start of 2017, we conducted our first sea level rise vulnerability assessment and a social vulnerability to climate change analysis. And I'm gonna take several slides to show you some of the results of that work. This is our first slide, or our first map. So what you're looking at here are the combined effects of sea level rise. So again, rising tide, coastal storm flooding and erosion. And what the assumption is on this map is that all of our, our protections, so that involves seawalls, riprap, which are those big boulders you see on the side of the cliffs, um, the small seawall that we have here, Calmaine Beach, and the, the near coast levee system. We assume that all of that will be maintained and held in this uh, map. So what do we see here? We see no big surprises, I have to say. We've seen uh, lots of flooding happening in our beach flats area. We will continue to see greater magnitude and frequency of that. We also see some more flooding over at Natural Bridges, Bethany Curve, and at the harbor. We see increased erosion throughout the coast, less so where we do have that riprap and seawalls. So as you can see, however, also that we're showing you different time horizons. So the darker the color is the closer to our baseline year, which was 2010. And then as the colors get lighter, we're moving out to year 2100. And you can see by the numbered um, facilities, we have a number of critical facilities that in this map, maybe don't show that they're vulnerable, but when I show you the next map, where we make the assumption that all these coastal protective structures fails, there's a difference. Um, what else did I wanna say about this slide? So what, what kind of science is this based on? So at the time that we did this assessment, this was based on the latest guidance from the Ocean Protection Council, who issues guidance on how do you, um, what depths and what kind of scenarios do you look at for sea level rise? Um, so we utilize that and what you can see is we had projected by 2030, we're looking at about four inches, 2060, 2.4 feet, and 2100, 5.2 feet. Now something that I have to say about those projections is that right when we were at the tail end of the sea level rise vulnerability assessment, the Ocean Protection Council came out with new guidance and that guidance contained, they wanted to get away from specific time horizons and start to talk about more just sea level rise depth. And what they also identified in uh, that latest guidance is that California could be experienced up to 10 feet of sea level rise by year 2100. You see, we've only modeled 5.2 feet here, right? And so, you know, I get asked a lot about how how do you reconcile what the city has done with that fact? And right now there are no models available yet. One is coming out soon that actually model these different conditions. And so in absence of that, what we say is, well, if we know that we're on an emissions trajectory, remember the emissions trajectory is really largely what defines the magnitude of sea level rise. The more emissions we release, the warmer it's gonna get, the more the ocean's gonna expand, and the, uh, the glaciers are gonna melt, right? So those are very correlated. Um, but, uh, you know, so how do we think about this 10 feet? Well, that means that we are on a very fast track, right, for, to reach these depths, and that these depths are probably going to come sooner if we're on the 10 feet trajectory. So that's kind of how I contextualize the 10 feet absent the data that actually models this. Now, USGS has a product called Cosmos that is coming out, it was supposed to come out for the Central Coast last year. 
it's imminently coming out. Unfortunately, the government shutdown delayed them a bit at the beginning of the year. But um, I was actually I had a meeting with them right before this, and you know, we we're talking about how we can use Cosmos on our future projects. Um, so that is coming. So now let's look at this other slide where we say that all of the coastal protection it has failed or has gone away. And what do you see once again? Well, even more pronounced coastal flooding, right? In the beach flats, lower ocean area, we see Neary Lagoon, uh, which is near our wastewater treatment plant, and even um, our police station. We see some, some flooding possible down there. Um, and then, of course, we see more pronounced erosion. In fact, had we, if we just let the coast erode, we could probably see the inundation erosion into the first block of West Cliff, right? But um, we do have protective structures there. So what we've done he here is shown you kind of the best case and the worst case, right? So let's keep going here. What other things do we have to, oh, you know what, before I move on though, I do want to share with you some stats on this. So we have quantified the value of the roadway, the utilities, the value of the properties, um, part value parklands that are in these coastal inundation zones. And what we're facing is by 2060, up to half a billion dollars of damages, and by 2100, over one billion in damages. And that's not including non-market valuation of ecosystem services, losses to tourism and recreation. So we know we're really underestimating that with that figure, but it's, a, it's the first time we've ever been able to even put a number to it, you know, to even quantify over time horizons corresponding to these different depths of sea level rise. Yeah. Those areas that are not connected to the ocean, so just near near the lagoon and around the police station, um, are those where sea level would be during high tide, or is that just during flood situations? Well, it influences groundwater, and these already have high groundwater tables here, so that is largely driving this. Now, with near the lagoon, there is a connection to the coast. Um, we do have stormwater pipes that are able to flow in both directions there. So that, that answers your question, yeah? I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, if you have a barrier, a seawall barrier, now the San Lorenzo River has to flow into the ocean. So you can't put up a barrier to stop the river. No, you so can't. So if the sea level rises, it's going to flow into the, uh, into the river basin and, uh, and upstream as, as, as far as, as it equilibrates. So you're going to necessarily have flooding uh, in beside the San Lorenzo River. A absolutely. So you bring up actually a good point. Thank you for both of your questions. What I'm showing you here, I have to give you an, uh, one of the caveats, is that this is only coastal flooding. This doesn't even account for climate influence precipitation and runoff and what kind of hydrology and flooding does that produce. That's another project that I'm working on right now, trying to marry up the coastal flooding with the hydraulics and hydrology that's happening with the river. Um, so that we can understand what does the combined effect look like. And I'm going to be talking about barriers um, in a moment as well. Good questions, thank you. So moving on, we have a lot of other things to consider besides infrastructure, right? Um, infrastructure, public safety, I mean, they're, they're high priorities. But what about coastal access? We have nearly three dozen coastal access points here in Santa Cruz. The Coastal Act prioritizes coastal access, so it's something we need to be very mindful of. Um, and of course, that goes right along with our community culture is being able to get on the beach and get onto the, the tide pools and so forth. So that's something that we, um, I'll be talking more about uh, when I talk about uh, our coastal resilience projects. That there will always students. be a coast. There will always be a coast. <laughs> <laughs> where, 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 <laughs> just where will it be? And where will we be? Right. <laughs> The other thing I want to point out, of course, going along with access, we have nearly two dozen surf breaks in Santa Cruz. We were, I was able to partner with, um, they call him the surf professor, he's from CSU Channel Islands, Dr. Dan Reineman, and he did uh, a break-by-break -break analysis of really from steamer to cow and found that those surf points most likely will be drowned sometime between 2040 and 2060. Mm -hmm. Again, a big part of our culture and identity here in Santa Cruz, a big draw for 
tourism here in Santa Cruz. What does that mean? They'll be, I don't know. They'll be drowned. They will not be able to break any longer. The, the water will get so high that the geomorphology of the land will no longer allow the breaking of the waves. Yes. Is that at the 5.2 to 2100, or is that more accelerated? No, no. Um, he, he, no, he did use these. Yes, okay, he so used. Okay, so we could expect it between sooner than that. No, oh, okay. no. Between 2040 and 2060 is okay. when we're he has projected okay. um, when we're expecting that. Oh my God! It'll still so break when it's big and when it's low tide. It's yeah. gonna make it <laughs> really difficult. Well, you know what's interesting wow. is I have this. I have several really smart interns, but and so I just brought him into the project a few months ago, and we're talking about this, and he's a surfer, and he's like, but Tiffany, I know that in Australia they've got a sand pump that pumps sand so that they can have the break still. Maybe we can do that here. And I said, oh, I like the way you think that you're not jaded yet. Um, I said, you know, maybe. But there's a lot of regulatory constraints about what you put in the water, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't know that that's something that we would be able to do. However, it is something that we can look at in the context of some of these projects that I'm going to share with you in a moment. So, and then of course we have habitat. I know there's a lot going on here, but what you're looking at is all of these different types of shading are all um, habitat, vulnerable habitat. And so you can see the orange are our fire hazard zones. I know we're talking about sea level rise, but this, this has both on it. You see what I've already shown you, the sea level rise hazards, and you see there's a lot of coincidence of habitat and hazards. Um, we have critical monarch habitat here, believe it or not, right here uh, on the very coast of West Cliff. We have riparian and aquatic habitat both here and at the river. You know, so there's important habitat considerations that we're looking at as well. And then the social piece. So this is a piece of work that I'm really proud of. You know, again, I collaborated with Dr. Giuliano Khalil, who is a professor at the Middlebury Institute down in Monterey. And as I mentioned, we really take to heart that um, equity needs to be a key piece in our work because as is commonly known, the impacts of sea level rise most generally, or the impacts of climate change, are more gen are generally impacting vulnerable populations more severely. So, and that is the case here in Santa Cruz. Um, let me tell you what we did, and then I'll tell you how to decipher this map. So, we built a social vulnerability score based on the incidence of poverty, disability, elderly, English not spoken as a first language, and crime. Everything but crime was taken from census data. And then we use localized crime data. And, and we're talking about major crime, not petty crime. And we built a score based on the incidence of all of these drivers of social vulnerability. Would you repeat those one more time? Sure. Uh, incidence of disability, mm -hmm. elderly, crime, uh, poverty, <laughs> and English not spoken mm -hmm. as a first language. Thank you. You're welcome. We compiled these scores by census block group. So that's generally bigger than a neighborhood block, right? And then we ranked all of the blocks relative to one another to understand what, where are the areas that are most socially vulnerable, and then secondly, what are the drivers of that social vulnerability? So what you see here then, the red census block groups are those that have the very highest vulnerability scores, and the green have the lowest. And Again, there isn't a big surprise here that vulnerability down in the Beach Flats area is driven by incidents of poverty, folks who don't speak English as a first language, and sometimes crime. Over in this area, uh, it's driven by uh, incidents of uh, elderly folks uh, who have mobility issues, right, and that, or could have mobility issues, I don't want to make any generalizations, but could have mobility issues and say, there was some kind of fire over in our on a gulch in our open space. Mm -hmm. What this tells us is that we know that our emergency responders need to get here first, right, to these folks that, and, it, and in fact, <coughs> their emergency routes already do. They already know this information, and that's how they route. Um, what we're looking at, though, on the coast, since the coast is our focus today, 
is again the high social vulnerability in the beach flats area but over here you see some median high social vulnerability and that is driven by incident of elderly folks over here as well so that's going to be helpful for us in these upcoming projects now a couple things on this one we've only scratched the surface on how to use this i'll give you another example down here we know now we knew already but now we really have the evidence to to support this is that anything that goes out with respect to flood notification or flood insurance or reverse 911 calls in acute emergency situations it needs to go out in both english and spanish right and so i'm working with our emergency services folks to make that happen um, but again, we just started to scratch the surface of this. Social vulnerability is called out in our two future projects as another key piece. I have to say though, the term social vulnerability is not really the best term. It can be offensive to people who are in these groups to make that assumption that they're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so really, I took some training on this recently, and I said, well, what, what's the term that I should use? And the experts say, you just name these groups. You say, elderly folks, people of color. You know, so I'm trying to adjust my terminology to, I certainly don't want to offend people, and I don't want to use a catch-all phrase that is you know, not appropriate, so I'm just highlighting that, that I'm trying to, we're trying to figure out the right way to talk about this. Um, it doesn't make anyone feel uncomfortable. It makes everyone feel included. So um, more on that in a bit. Okay, so that was our adaptation work while we were, just remember I showed you all that because that's what we were doing to update our climate adaptation plan. So we updated all of those pieces. Um, those were new pieces, but we updated everything else in terms of our other hazards. We used the California Fourth Climate Change Assessment that came out at the end of this process to update all kinds of things. I mean, we're so fortunate here in California that the state recognizes they need to make these data available for us that local governments don't have the ability to commission customized studies for this kind of stuff. So they're really appreciative of the state and the resources they've provided. So all of that got packaged into our draft climate adaptation plan. And then we took that, look, and that plan contains 41 different strategies that are prioritized, and they really hit on education. Education is our number one rated uh, strategy. They deal with policy, you know, when should we consider elevating buildings or putting a requirement in to elevate buildings down in the beach flats area? and hard and soft infrastructure so the difference there hard infrastructure is the more of that seawall rip wrap um, a barrier things like that soft infrastructure can be um, things like living seawalls vegetated dunes the kinds of things that bring in other ecos or other benefits co-benefits like ecosystem services uh, habitat that kind of thing so we have consideration of all of these um, types of strategies in our adaptation plan. So then we took it on the road and we embarked upon a nine month, uh, we had over 50 events, um, outreach campaign. And I wanted to share with you of these 51 events, something we're also really proud of is that 20% of them were either <clears throat> in communities that we deemed vulnerable um, or with these communities of people, these groups. And so we really went all out, kind of a scattershot approach. I actually did a talk like this. Um, we did a number of talks, community meetings, um, individual focus groups, um, really just ran the gamut of types of outreach. Um, did story Spanish language story time at the library, um, did book shadowing the bookmobile, just really tried to get the message out there that the city is working on this and we want you to be involved. Um, Surfers so important. <laughs> <laughs> and packaged all that up and here's our final um, plan update that was adopted in October of 2018 and again I have a copy of it back here if you're interested in looking at it on the middle table here so there's that 
How did we make this happen? Well, I mentioned the partnerships and the collaboration, it's so key. And, um, you know, I've been really fortunate to have some excellent academic collaborators. But I have to also talk about, we have um, regional collaboratives that I work with where we're sharing information. Hey, did you hear about this new study that came out? Or webinars on, oh, the new sea level rise uh, guidance came out. You know, that kind of thing. So a lot of collaboration through these networks. We also collaborate quite closely with the county. I happen to be on the County Commission on the Environment, which puts me in a good position to know what's happening there. Um, and we have a, we formed a sea level rise working group with the county and Capitola and the city. And in fact, we've been doing um, an exchange program with the county of Marin. Marin is, I would say, a little bit of he ahead of us here in the Santa Cruz area with their adaptation planning. They came down here, brought their planners and folks like me down here in December. We did a three hour powwow on you know, the details, the policy details, the infrastructure details of what we were working on. And then we went and we took a look. We walked, we went from Capitola to um, East Cliff to West Cliff, you know, down the beaches in West Cliff. And actually tomorrow morning, we're going up to Marin to do the same thing, mm -hmm. to have that, that exchange. And it's so beneficial because it's really hard with, I mean, I'm a program of one person basically, and you know, we do have a lot of our other staff involved, but it's really hard to kind of stay on top of everything that's going on. And so this really is a, the collaboration is really wonderful for us. So I just, I had to talk about that. So what's ahead? And I'm gonna get into a lot of details on this. Um, so first of all, we do not have a tidal gauge here in Santa Cruz. The nearest ones are in San Francisco and Monterey. And because of that, with the new sea level rise guidance uh, that's out, you have to interpolate between those two points. Yes. What is a tidal gauge? So a tidal gauge allows you to measure sea level rise and sea depth and many other things as well, but that's what we, for the purpose of this, we would, we would be interested in. Where would you want to put it? We would like to put it at the harbor, potentially on the harbor bridge, potentially. That's where we've had some initial recommendations from Gary Griggs. We've been talking with Noah about the potential to bring a tidal gauge here. Um, and we'll see where that goes. It's not an inexpensive thing to do and it requires ongoing maintenance costs that are pretty high. And so we're trying to figure that out. We do think it would be beneficial to have that here, particularly as we develop, and I'm gonna talk more about this in a moment, a monitoring triggers and threshold program. So what are we going to monitor and what thresholds are we going to tip over that are gonna trigger us to take specific actions? And I'm gonna get a lot more into that in just a minute. Um, so tidal gauge potentially coming. In the mountains, they measure snow depths with a gauge that just consists of a, a shaft of some sort and foot markings on it, and somebody comes up there, just like the snow is up to 10 feet. Yeah. All you need is to stick in the ground and see how high the water is. <laughs> yeah, but you also have settling and shifting, tectonic shifting, and that's where some of that maintenance comes in, is actually a tidal gauge has to be calibrated every year. And so we do have that already. We have that at the river mouth. Um, and we also have at the river mouth a, um, a, tra a, so, a, so, a transducer, so we're able to get depth there at, you know, at that kind of uh, freshwater, uh, saltwater interface. There you are, you got your tidal gauge. Yeah. yeah, but it doesn't get us all that we really need. But yeah, good comment. Um, I already mentioned the San Lorenzo River climate influence flood mapping. I have that project fully scoped out and I'm looking for the right grant opportunity to get that work done. West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan, I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in just a moment. Sea level rise policies and strategies for beach use, beach access and coastal protection. That's another project I'm gonna talk about. We also um, need to complete a local coastal program amendment. Um, the Coastal Commission requires that we integrate sea level rise policies into our local coastal program. The local coastal program, or the LCP, is what allows us to issue coastal development permits on behalf of the Coastal Commission. So by having a certified LCP, they know that we will issue 
uh, permits that are consistent with the Coastal Act. And so the requirement is to bring in sea level rise policies. And similarly, I already mentioned SB 379, which requires the inclusion of sea level rise and adaptation in the safety element of the general plan, which is our overarching policy document that guides all we do as a city. So those two things have, um, are already underway. And then we had never really reported on adaptation in the past, so we've made the commitment to report to council annually. So I'm gonna focus the, our attention on these uh, next two projects, which together um, are Resilient Coast Santa Cruz projects. So that's what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk here. So this Resilient Coast Santa Cruz initiative, it's two projects, and the goals are twofold. Number one is to engage with our community to promote an understanding of sea level rise, of the risks and the vulnerabilities, um, as well as the trade-offs, the costs, and the regulatory constraints of different adaptation options. Sea level rise, planned retreat, you know, get, making sure that people fully understand the trade-offs and the costs. And then secondly, to establish a community vision for, a resilient, for resilient coastal management um, in the context of sea level rise. So these, again, we need the community to be involved in this. Um, it's, it's critically important. So those are the goals of the project. So let's talk about West Cliff Drive. West Cliff Drive, of course, as we've already talked about, we're facing erosion, potentially loss of pocket beaches, like its beach and coastal access, and then potentially transportation impacts depending on you know, how fast erosion happens and what we're doing to counter it. Of course, also has been, has been featured in the Sentinel, we have some issues around emergency permits for things like when the, um, when the path blows out or when we have a sinkhole and we've had to take emergency measures. We have to go back and resolve those permits with the Coastal Commission. So that's a kind of a secondary objective of this project. So this project, and then more, just more to show you. So remember, this is what we're kind of blown up on this. This is what we're facing. I already mentioned that you know potentially we could see up to uh, a block inward of migration if we do nothing and we let the seawalls and the riprap just all you know fail. So we've already seen that. Here's uh, here's what just erosion only looks like because remember this was the combined effect of rising tide erosion and coastal storm flooding. This is erosion only. The black and white lines are the riprap in the seawalls. And the red shows you um, with armoring, so assuming that all that protection is going to stay, what we're expecting in terms of erosion. And the yellow shows if, um, if those things fail, those protective structures, what we're looking at. We've already <coughs> talked about kind of what that looks like. But you know, look at Lighthouse Point. Look at the road. I mean, there's some serious things to look at here. Okay, what did our adaptation plan say about this? These are some of the strategies that were called out in the adaptation plan. They're pretty general, you know, cri prioritize coastal protection structures for up upgrade and replacement, <clears throat> implement beach management policies and plans. Again, look at coastal armoring, beach nourishment, green infrastructure, and managed retreat or planned retreat protect visitors serving venues, uh, recreation and natural resources, and protect the natural sh shoreline. We've been doing stuff on West Cliff. I mean, in addition to addressing the emergency repairs and so forth, we've been increasing biodiversity through some coastal restoration projects. Groundswell Coastal Ecology is one of our great partners that are do that doing that work uh, at Natural Bridges, Seabright Beach. We've been expanding, and I don't want to get any booze on this, but uh, access affordable transportation through the bike share launch. And that's called out in our um, general plan also. And then we have con conducted that initial outreach to our community through our climate adaptation plan outreach campaign. So that's kind of what's called for. This is kind of some of the stuff we're doing, but here's what's coming up next. So got a $342,000 grant from Caltrans to look at this uh, West Cliff with a transportation focus, but we are looking at habitat, tourism, recreation, beaches. Um, the consultant that we've selected is Rebel Coastal. We went through a competitive bid process. They happen to be our local home team. They, um, Dave Rebel is here in Santa Cruz. Um, who he has on his team is uh, Ross Clark from Central Coast Wetlands Group. Hara Kasunich and Associates are the engineers 
Fair and Piers, who already is the city's transportation planner, Gary Griggs, and Charles Lester. Charles Lester used to be the executive director of the Coastal Commission. We have a very strong team on this project. I'm super excited for us to get started on this. What are we doing exactly on this project? The first part of the project is conducting a base condition inventory of the coastline and all of the assets on it. We've already begun. <laughs> that work my poor interns have been out in the rain GPSing all <laughs> kinds of different things and noting conditions now they're only doing things like benches and trash cans of course the experts are doing the sea walls and the riprap and the transportation network and things like that we also will be doing an alternatives analysis of the adaptation strategies so what are potential strategies policies infrastructure that we could utilize and I have to say, after every one of these steps, there's public meetings involved so that we come to you with a, a incremental piece of the project, you give us feedback, we go back and we revise it based on your feedback. Again, that's building that community vision. So then we do uh, the cost benefit analysis of these adaptation strategies to inform that community discussion. You know, what are the costs? What are some of those non-market costs? How will some of these things if we allow retreat, how does that affect tourism and transportation and coastal access, right? We will be um, establishing a monitoring trigger and threshold program, and I'm gonna show you some graphic visualizations of what that means. So I know we've just talked about that in concept. And then based on all this information and the public feedback, we actually will produce some conceptual design alternatives. So what would this actually look like? And some of that work is being going to be modeled in um, a sea level rise virtual reality application that will be available for mobile phones. So you can see, well, here's a couple different options. What do you like? Number one, number two. You know, once you kind of are informed on the trade-offs. What's the EAU? Pardon me? EAU, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Cost-benefit analysis of uh, business as usual. So just keep going how we're going and don't make any changes, right? versus the implementation, implementation of some of these strategies. All of this gets wrapped up into a plan that the Coastal Commission must approve, and that sets forth our path, our what we call an adaptive pathways path, or charting a course for adaptation. And I'm gonna, again, share more with you about that in just a moment. Some of the outreach that we have planned for this, I already mentioned the virtual reality, something really exciting and very novel, and I can't wait to share it. It's already very developed for kind of the base conditions. We have actually, believe it or not, a card game in development um, that really helps people to understand in a simple way the trade-offs that you need to think about with managing this kind of stuff. Um, community meetings, focus groups, user surveys, coastal use surveys, and we're going to have open office hours once a month for anybody that just wants to come in and talk about any aspect of these projects. All of this outreach will be integrated with this more beach focused project I'm going to talk about in a moment. But we, this is, yes? Are we going to need a phone to run the app, or can we run it on a regular computer? You, you can use it on the phone, but we're hoping that we're going to ha be able to have it on the computer as well. Right now, I have it in what's called an Oculus Viewer. It's kind of a, one of those goggle headsets, and it'll be translated into a phone. And I'm hoping the computer also, if we can stretch our budget that far. And where do you get the card game? We're developing it. We're, I'm actually developing it. We're kind of developing it outside of work with a group of actually game design folks from UCSC and um, uh, some local planners in town. And it's pretty cool. I'm thinking about maybe having like some pub nights or something like that where we just, you know, we drink a pint of beer and we talk sea level rise. You know, <laughs> you know that sounds kind of cool. <laughs> okay, so here's. I want to show you one, so one of the outputs of these projects are, is this tr monitoring triggers and threshold program. And they have, to sh they have to develop it using visualizations that help folks really understand what this means. So what we're looking at here, this is, Imper these, this is just an example. This isn't Santa Cruz, we haven't developed this yet. So this is Imperial Beach who has done this work. Um, and this is where they're thinking about how are they going to phase in different strategies. Their trigger, what they're monitoring here, is depth of sea level rise. That's what you've got across mm -hmm. the top. Now, 
we know that these years may not correspond to those depths of sea level rise. That's why we're trying to get away from time frames and just talk about depths of sea level rise. So they're looking at a variety of different categories of how we look at adaptation strategies, protect, protect and accommodate, accommodate and retreat, or just retreat. So what you're seeing here is that maintaining the existing arboring, it's gonna get us get this Imperial Beach through to 1.6 feet. But at 1.6 feet, they know that they need to have in place, they need to have replaced the seawall and they need to start thinking about retrofitting their stormwater pumps and doing some sediment management. When they get to their next tipping point, they need to elevate the roadways and structures and start thinking, planning the, the planned retreat. And then at the next tipping point, they need to start doing phase uh, relocation of infrastructure. So the beauty, the adaptive pathway of this is that you understand what your path needs to be, but it's based on when you hit these specific trigger points. Mm -hmm. So it's useless to have time horizons because we don't know exactly when these are going to happen. But if we have a flexible pathway, it puts us in a better position of being resilient, right? So that's what we want to get out of this. Yes? The topographic map that shows the elevation of Santa Cruz, or the county or city or whatever, so you can look up where we live and say, oh, you know, I'm good to 30 meters or whatever. We don't have that right now. Um, that is something that you could look at our maps that are in our adaptation plan, but that isn't a tool that we have available right now. Yes, there's a couple of questions here. I was just going to share, um, I work for a nonprofit called Climate Central. Oh, yes. That has sea level rise maps that anyone can access and you can view scenarios for different sea level depths. So yes. So it is possible for any location in Santa Cruz to actually check it out. Absolutely, and that's actually, thank you for bringing that up. Um, the Climate Central um, Surging Seas, right? Right. Yeah, so it's a really great tool. Um, it integrates with Google Maps, um, or Google Earth, I should say. Um, and I've used it to show some folks like, hey, this is, this is what things could look like because we have a, it's very similar to our virtual reality sea level rise um, app that we're working on right now. But thank you for mentioning that. So that surging seas climate central, check it out. It's pretty interesting. Yes, it's are in the back. I'm looking at your numbers up there, and I, so what disturbs me is that you're using a linear model for melt rates. This is not our work. This is just an example I'm showing you of. Well, what, I, what I'm trying to point out though is what, what you're basing your work on this type of data. And that's a linear model. And that linear model is not what's happening. The most recent data that just came out a month ago shows that we're on an exponential course and that oh. melt rates and sea level rise rates have tripled over the past 25 years. If they triple again in the next 25 years, then that means that we've got less than 20 years before all of Santa Cruz is underwater. You're absolutely right. Well, the, again, this is not our data that we're using, but it doesn't matter when it comes. If 1.6 feet comes in 10 years. What if it comes next year? Are you ready? It's too late. No, we're not ready. <laughs> Quite frankly, no. no, no, no. <laughs> so that's why this path, this is flexible, is that 1.6 feet could be, it could be a couple years, it could be 30 years. But if we have a plan for it and we know when that tipping point is and we follow that path, we are on a resilience path, right? But point taken, for sure. I mean, again, the uncertainty around when this stuff's <coughs> gonna happen is unclear. And I, you know, the USGS model, again, is coming out soon that we'll, we will be able to utilize. This is not using the USGS model either. So, you know, these aren't the most current numbers, the most current science that's out there. I would, lo I would love to take your questions. Can I only have a few more slides. Do you mind if I get through these slides and then we'll do questions? Because otherwise, I feel like I might not finish. Is that okay? Would you just tell me, what does retreat mean? Retreat means moving back from the coast. So moving back development from the coast. Moving back potentially roads from the coast. Moving back infrastructure from the coast. And putting them where? <laughs> wherever you can find it, wherever it works. Well, here, I mean, here in Santa Cruz, we don't have a lot of options for that. 
right? We're a fully developed coastline. We don't have a lot of empty property or, or anything like that. So I make, I want to make clear that I have no preconceived notions about what's going to come out of this project. I don't know. We have regulatory constraints. There are cost constraints. And we want to understand what the community wants to see. And every, there are going to be some groups that are not going to be on the same page about what they want. And the real challenge is how are we as a community going to come to some consensus around what we want to see on how we manage this coastline. <clears throat> and that's going to be the challenge for me as the manager of these projects, is to have a very inclusive, transparent, and fair process to get us to that point, right? So I believe me, I'm not underestimating the challenge of this work. This is another example of how we can look at adaptation pathways or adaptive pathways. Again, this is Imperial Beach. This is an, a potential armoring strategy and the evolution of that over time. So what you're looking at here is existing year 2030, 2050, and 2080. And so what they're showing here is, okay, maybe we start with Rebecca, which again is um, riprap. And you see we have a nice beach line here. We have our intertidal zone where we have lots of nice habitat and so forth. And potentially by 2030, that needs to be transitioned into a seawall, a more robust infrastructure. But we also see that the intertidal, the beach zone, well, not quite yet. The beach isn't quite starting to squeeze in. But when we get to 2050, what do we see? Sea level rise is happening. You see the beach is getting narrower, right? And we, we uh, let's see, we keep moving on to 2080. And you see that here we are, we're all the way, sea level rise is all the way to the seawall. Well, what do you notice here? Sea this wall is going to last 50 years. <laughs> That's, again, this is not our work. This is an example. But the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that what have we lost here? The beach. We've lost the beach. So that's a trade off with the seawall, is that we will lose beach. We lose the seawall. So Seawalls it, kill beaches. Right. So at Main Beach, you know, how are we going to deal with sea level rise when we don't have anywhere to move back? You know, and I don't know the answers to this. That's what we're trying to sort out in these, these projects. So that leads me to the second project. So that's the West Cliff project. The sea level rise policies and strategies um, work is a $200,000 grant from the Coastal Commission. Our consultant on this work is the Central Coast Wetlands Group. They're almost the same teams that are working on the West Cliff project which is a good thing. Um, it means that we can integrate across these projects, get more for our money, have a better outcome at the end. So outreach is going to be coordinated with Westcliff. It's basically the same project, but focused on the beaches. So that's Natural Bridges, Main Beach, uh, Cow Beach, and Seabright Beach. Um, what has to come out of this project is an amended local coastal program. You remember I told you that's the thing that allows us to issue coastal development permits. So we will be, the Coastal Commission has a guidance document and they recommend a number of different kinds of policies around sea level rise. But it's not really a one size fits all kind of thing. So what we're doing in this project is we're going to spend a lot of time looking at the secondary implications of some of these policies. Just like we just talked about, you can't really implement a retreat policy when you have nowhere to retreat. Or can you? I mean, I, I don't know. But those are the kinds of things that we need to think about. Or if we put in a seawall, what does that mean for our beach and our beach-dependent tourism economy? You know, so those are the things we're going to look at in this beaches project in <coughs> detail. Um, let me show you a couple of things. These are some sample maps that potentially could come out of this. <laughs> this was for uh, Central Coast Wetlands Group did this for the Monterey Bay area, uh, the whole Monterey Bay. And what this shows us is the location of beach loss due to rising tides at different time horizons. So you see, like by 2030, oh goodness, beaches. Here we are at Main Beach. Uh, they say 2100, but our, we have more recent information that shows that it might be earlier. You know, so a lot of beach loss is projected to be happening. So we will be doing more specific and updated maps in our project that will be similar to this. And then here's that good old uh, Imperial Beach um, 
uh, adaptation kind of pathway thing. This time we're looking at a different strategy that looks at the use of green infrastructure. So here we are again starting with some revetment. We've got some maybe some <coughs> cobbles underneath the beach here. Maybe the next thing we need to do after this revetment is we need to install a vegetated dune where we're augmenting the sand <coughs> and elevation. The next um, post-adaptation strategy, so five years later, you see the beach is starting to get squeezed a little bit, right? And the depth, the, uh, depth of that sand layer is getting uh, narrower and narrower. And as you keep going, the same thing ha you know, is happening. More beach squeeze, but you've got that dune that is providing uh, surge protection, habitat, has a lot of co-benefits. The state has a huge focus on green infrastructure. And I'm not really sure how much green infrastructure we can do here in Santa Cruz. We don't have huge beaches you know, for, for dunes. Um, I'm not sure we have the potential for living seawalls, but it is explicitly called out in both these projects that we need to be looking at green infrastructure solutions that could be appropriate here as well. And with that, this is my last slide. I just want to remind you to please continue to reduce your emissions as aggressively as possible. And again, I have some action sheets back here, as does Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. Um, you can also look at other resources like Drawdown. That's a very common um, framework right now for prioritizing how you want to um, reduce emissions. Secondly, please know and understand your risks. The action sheet also has tips on flood, uh, wildfire erosion and so forth and as I mentioned there's a revision in progress right now on that because it's got some reference to ice plant which is not appropriate mm -hmm. um, also consult uh, surging seas if you'd like mm -hmm. you know that's a good good way to take a look and there are other viewers but I do think quite honestly surging seas is the best one right now yeah and then be, please continue to be part of the conversation visit our website cityofsantacruz.com slash resilient coast um, sign up for notifications today. Again, I will not hit you up for anything but these projects. And please participate in our outreach events. It really um, is going to be important for us to work together on developing this community vision. And that's something I'm really looking forward to. And I hope all of you will be there and help us out with that. So I know there's a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer them. I want to pick up here on keep reducing emissions. Yes. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, the city emphasized how the city can reduce emissions. And they had, I believe, plans to uh, uh, improve the insulation of a lot of city buildings mm -hmm. to reduce emissions. And then there was also big discussion about the other big factor emission, uh, automobiles and transportation. My question to you is, what did, it, did the city do anything about uh, insulating city buildings more over the last 10 years? I don't know specifically about insulation, but I do know we have been aggressively doing energy efficiency work. We've replaced a lot of HVAC, done a lot of lighting retrofits in municipal buildings. Um, I, do, I don't know about the insulation piece. That's prior to my time and I'm not sure that I've heard anything necessarily, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, but we are, we definitely, we continue to do energy efficiency. We just got, um, <coughs> excuse me, about a year and a half ago, um, a California Energy Commission grant to do uh, advanced building management systems, or energy management systems in um, two of our buildings um, and have been able to replace the HVAC and those are two buildings that are real energy hogs. So I think on the municipal side, I feel like we're doing a good job on the emissions reduction. So what thank about, you for that question. May I just ask one more, what about public transportation? There's going one study after the other. And uh, you know, I like to get out of my car also if we have better public transportation, like in Europe where you typically don't walk more than 10 minutes and there's sure. a bus coming every 10 minutes. Yeah, I hear you. Um, of course, I'm sure you know the Metro is separate from the city and we do work really closely with them. And I know that um, our transportation planager, manager, or I'm sorry, transportation planner is packaging uh, a transportation demand management program to help with that, uh, particularly with downtown employees that's gonna come out very soon. Um, so there's lots of work at the city. I'm sure you've seen in the past five years the green lanes that have 
popped up everywhere. We've brought in over $20 million for that kind of work. So, you know, I know it's not happening fast enough and, you know, we're not getting everything we want. It, uh, you know, we're doing the best we can with the resources that are out there. And, you know, I appreciate your comment on that. And, you know, make sure you talk to your city council members about that. I did. Great, right. thank you. Um, from a public health point of view, one the yes. thing that, uh, uh, of course, the beach is enormously important and West Cliff's enormously important, uh, but I'm concerned about the sewage treatment plant. Is there a plan for moving that? There is no plan for moving that. Um, we do, ha we're very aware of what's going on there. Um, we have a number of specific strategies called out, some of which had already been completed from the first adaptation plan. Things like <clears throat> sealing our pipe galleries and, and those kinds of things, designing cutoff walls between Neary Lagoon and the treatment plant, that kind of thing. So it's that's not an easy proposition. It's a hundred million dollar plus facility. It's a regional facility that collects, you know, throughout the county. Um, relocation is n not necessarily something we're thinking about right now, mm -hmm. but. Um, I would like, we need to do a, some more in-depth study on the wastewater treatment plant specifically with respect to sea level rise. And our public works department is on board with that plan. So are they doing some kind of a scenario if there was an inundation of it? If there was inundation of it? I'm not, I don't know of that. I don't know. Yes. Has there been any um, serious thought about putting um, a seawall from like where um, Dream Inn is all the way over across the boardwalk? all the way over to the river mouth and then maybe along the levees going up so that you protect against the 100 year flood as well that's going to come out of these projects we have that will i'm sure certainly be an option that we'll take a look at but at least for the next 100 years or something like your downtown yeah yeah but remember again seawall no beach <laughs> right, at least got the boardwalk in downtown. So. Right. So well, that's exactly the kind of thing we want to hear from the community. What's the community consensus on that kind of a trade-off, for sure? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I, c I got here late, so I don't know if you covered this, but I'm wondering if you're looking at tsunamis and that issue? Yes, um, we are. And we have, in our climate adaptation plan, which is right over there, we have mapped um, we have mapped uh, the tsunami hazard zone and taken a look at you know what is vulnerable within that area. I have to say that tsunami is um, it's mostly a public works and an emergency management function. It's however you raise a very good point. You know when we did our climate adaptation plan update, we you know we did it to best best available science. We you know we did a really strong job with it. But really now there is a focus on connecting hazards. So connecting sea level rise influence tsunami, right? And connecting, you know, like in Santa Barbara what happened, a um, drought which caused a tinderbox, which caused a fire, which a hundred year storm came in and did, the, you know, created this huge landslide. There's like three or four different hazards right there. So that for me is kind of a next step and I have we do we have looked at landslide and how that coincides but connecting the hazards is super important and we're not quite there yet with everything so but thank you for bringing that point up definitely do yes you, sir uh, we live in a, a large bay how does that affect sea level rise versus the whole coast of California mm. <sighs> I don't I honestly don't know how to answer yeah, that question. That is why I want to have the tidal Almost. gauge because I think if you have a contiguous coastline without kind of this in this bay indentation, maybe that interpolation between two different <coughs> tidal gauges would be appropriate, but with the bay there, I'm just not so sure of that. Um, so I, I don't know I don't know the how to how else to answer that question right now, but I can I will certainly think about that and pose that question to our consultants in the context of these projects. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. You know, there's actually plenty of sand to replenish the beaches, and nature would very happily rebuild the beaches. The only problem is it's covered with houses. That's the bottom. The basic issue is it's human beings 
that are in the way of nature. If you move things out of the way for the people to do a job, she'll put the beaches and you know. Good point, good point. Yes, sir. This has been a great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank very you. informative. Thanks. How much of your time do you think is devoted to adaptation versus devoted to emissions? Uh, well, in the past, I would have said 50-50, but quite frankly, I'm probably spending more time on this right now right. than emissions reduction. Now, that there's several reasons for that. Um, number one, there's more resources in this space right now, and we have regulatory drivers, right? We have SB 379, we have Coastal Commission requirements, um, that kind of thing. So, um, and secondly, a lot of our emissions reduction work involves investment that we simply don't have the money for right now, um, unfortunately. That doesn't mean that there's not other things we can do. We partnered with Santa Cruz Climate Action Network last year to do um, a, a commercial business um, energy conservation campaign. Real simple, keep your doors closed if you're running AC or heat. We projected that that would have a high impact for us if, if we could get folks to do that in Santa Cruz. We got 215 businesses on board with that. Mm -hmm. We're embarking upon an anti-idling campaign with city schools right mm -hmm. now, which we also found has a high impact in terms of emissions reduction. So we'll be doing signage in the loading zones and complementary uh, education campaign. That interesting. With parent, I'd love to Thank talk to you more about that. With parent, gotta give big props to Santa Cruz Climate Action Network. We got some people here from there. Those guys pound the streets, talk to businesses. They do the advocacy work that we don't have the ability to do. So, yeah. Do you do anything, in just a real quick response, about land use, for example? Around emissions reduction? Yes, um, and how that space is going to be utilized when we have choices to build things. Hmm. I think you know where I'm going with that one. <laughs> um, well, it's a state requirement. It's part of the general plan. It's, it's it general. is, and I mean, you know, we have, a, we have our green building coordinator here actually who could probably better answer this so, question. Well, going back to your earlier question on what are the city's efforts in terms of emissions reduction. So um, we're fortunate that our city actively enforces our state's energy code for building energy consumption in our city. Uh, it's something that California, is, California can, can do is to advocate to the, each of their city councils and uh, really uh, request that their building departments also really enforce the full extent of our state's energy code. Because in terms of a lever that Californians can really for free uh, work on right now, it's that. Um, and then specifically, coming back to your later question, um, you know, one of the things you know, I'm looking at is um, our city is adding uh, a lot of cannabis uh, growth and uh, drying and processing facilities. So, so what what are the specific measures that will make that tremendous electric lighting load for the growth the, the most efficient? I don't. I'm not there yet. Um, there's some challenges, but it is something I'm. I'm looking at just today. I was looking at so, and, um, yeah. Thank you, Kurt. So this is Kurt Hurley in the back. I'm stoked to see him here. You know, other things that are happening is with Monterey Bay Community Power, there's a building electrification plan that will be developed. They, of course, along with the Air District, are bringing much more in uh, terms of resources for electric vehicles and electric vehicle charging. In terms of land use, you know, we do, we are committed to transit-oriented development. I really don't want to get into the um, library Fair conversation. Enough. Fair I really enough. don't. Um, but uh, I'm sure many of you have been following that and have opinions on that. Um, but we are trying to get to a transit-friendly, walkable, bikeable, you know, way to live here. So, yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, <clears throat> I sometimes walk downtown or else I'll drive, and a lot of the... Intersections are not particularly, I'll sit at an intersection where I don't have to for a really long time. And I know that there are now systems that are more sophisticated and are we looking at getting any of those kind of systems 
especially for the Water Street and the SoCal corridor? I don't know specifically where they, um, but I know we are using them extensively throughout the city. Um, I don't know what's planned necessarily for that um, that corridor uh, necessarily, but we definitely have synchronization of our signals. Um, obviously, not everywhere. Yeah, like the pedestrian things are. And some of those things are terrible. Yeah. There's no traffic and you can't walk. No, totally. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you all probably know. So just this past year, um, we got our ranking for our bike mode share. We are the number two city in the country. But what are we number one at? Bike and yeah, car it. collisions. <laughs> those, you know, we need to address that, right? And we are. We're working on that. Yes, sir. Um, on riprap along Westcliff and other places, um, I know that the Coastal Commission doesn't like that. Correct. Um, has there been any, uh, what's the latest on the discussions with them about that as um, a solution? That the, that's all to gonna get sorted out in the Westcliff plan. That is certainly one of the big regulatory constraints that we're gonna have to deal with is, you know, I mean, the thing is, is the Coastal Commission also prioritizes coastal access, yeah. right? Look what they allowed to ha on East Cliff. They have an integrated seawall that's over a mile long, right? Because they prioritize coastal access over the benefits of natural retreat. I really don't know what's going to happen here in Santa Cruz. We're going to sort that out in the next year and a half. And I hope you'll be part of that conversation. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, about the reducing emissions. Yes. You know, on Highway 1, every day, every single day, there's a traffic jam both ways. Is there any plan to change that? Because that's a, I'm sure it has a huge impact. You know, uh, that's not something that I know that we're necessarily working on right now. I mean, of course, trying to open up employment opportunities here, keep people from having to go over the hill, um, making sure that the Highway 17 Express routes are running efficiently. That's what I know about right now, but um, I don't know that the city's necessarily working on that particular um, aspect right now. So. It looks like a priority, no? Well, having a train, you know, we know there used to be a train between San Jose and Right, Cruz. right. That would take a lot of Right. I mean, that is, I, I mean, I hate to say this, but it is outside of our jurisdiction yeah. also. You know, I mean, we, we certainly would collaborate with others, I'm sure, on that, but I just, I don't know that there's anything We're happening. We're building the rail trail. We are building the rail trail. However, we have 92% of that funded either for design or construction right now. Yes, sir, in the back. We, we see the trajectory that you're presenting, and I, I so most people here have gotten plenty of information and already know not the exact number of feet the sea level will rise, but we, we know where we're headed. And that suggests, uh, maybe calls for everyone to consider what will my role be, what will, not, not my, what will my job be, probably volunteer job be, to arrest and reverse climate change. <coughs> that this is, it's clearly not something that we can wait for federal or city government to take care of. I mean, not to disparage that, that, that is essential that it be coordinated, mm -hmm. but the good news is that every person can have a role and, in this, and it's gonna go a lot better the, the more people step up and, and take a position. Yeah, absolutely, you're entirely right. Thank you, yes sir. So two things, number one, uh, you're driving through town, you're waiting at a red light. The green light is given to a direction where there are no cars waiting. It's, it's an aggravation to the driver, and, and it's, it's wasteful. It's, they're burning, everybody burns gas, and nobody it's gets to go. If we could just solve that problem, like a, a, you know, a traffic, a person directing traffic could make it work. If we could build that intelligence into the traffic sensors and controllers. I'll pass that feedback on to <laughs> 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 Thank you. So when you give the money figures, is it taken into account king tides and barometric tides and storm surges? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, another thing you could pass on, I would like you to pass on, is that the um, wastewater treatment plant, this will be a very unpleasant place 
if that is damaged. Yes, we're, we're aware of that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are there any strategies regarding groundwater levels? I know that as sea level rises, the groundwater level goes up. Um, and and that could, as you were saying, and you're showing your first map there, that that could cause flooding in localized areas, and that's going to be getting worse. Yes. What sorts of strategies? Um, Two. Okay. okay. So first of all, we do have some groundwater sensors throughout the city, and I'm thinking that potentially those could be utilized in that whole monitoring triggers mm -hmm. threshold program, right? When water table gets to this level. What do we need to do? Do we need to upsize our pumps? Do we, you know, we have stormwater pumps that pump out flooding. So that's one thing. Number two, we actually have been talking to Scripps um, in Ocean Oceanography Institute about an early coastal flood warning system that gives a four to seven day, they model. What hasn't been done before is modeling wave surge and what they do is they couple all these different sensors, including groundwater sensors, beach sensors, buoys, tidal gauges, that may be another avenue in which we might be able to get a tidal gauge, drone uh, surveys and so forth, to model uh, different, the, the wave profile and wave surge, because right now, you know, we have a good understanding based on the tides of when flooding might happen, but we don't have that climate influence wave action. And so that's another way that we are thinking that we could utilize. I mean, I know I'm not exactly answering your question, but that's kind of the line of thinking that we have right now around the, the groundwater. You touched on the answer when you said um, increasing the pumping yeah. out of near the lagoon, I presume. No, out of the beach flats area in lower ocean and the downtown area, we have pumps that pump that water back in to the river. And then, oh, that's right, yes, and then also near the lagoon, right? Yes, there are pumps there as well, yes. And so, yeah, I was thinking, I live right on area of the lagoon, so I'm yeah. like the <laughs> lowest part of town, so this is a very uh, yes. big interest to me. Yes. <laughs> I'm right near the sewer plant. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> pumps run on uh, fossil fuels. They're electric, yeah. But do remember, all of our electric is carbon-free because of Monterey Bay Community Power coming online last year. Yes, sir. Um, on on your uh, assumption that uh, was just now, on your assumption that uh, the sea level may rise uh, six feet in 2100, I believe. What is uh, your assumption on the temperature rise on the planet Earth? Uh, well, we have. That, are you dealing with two degrees or what more? We have local. I have updated our adaptation plan with localized temperature increases that are projected. I don't have that information on the top of my head, but I can look it up for you. Um, in terms of the sea level rise, remember I mentioned that we used the first sea level rise guidance that came out um, on how to do projections. So. Again, we're trying to get away from tying, and the state is trying to get away from tying a specific time horizon to a specific depth. That gives us more flexibility, again, that kind of adaptive pathways. So we recognize that we are most likely on a more you know, steep <coughs> emissions trajectory and thus will likely have greater sea level rise. I mean, when I, what I'm reading is, when you also to listen to Rick Nothenius, you know, he yes, thinks I've that, read, uh, read you know, we are by far too conservative, or he is much more pessimistic. And when you look at uh, Holland, my understanding is that Holland, who are really experts in building dams, that they, they say the for sea 10, level, 000. sorry? They, they design for the 10,000 year storm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We design for the 100 year storm oh, in the that, US. That. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't mean to interrupt your, your no, statement, I, I, though I thought... I just think uh, the, the probability that the sea level will rise much higher than we planned mm -hmm. is pretty high, I would say. It is. It is. It is. And why not but rather design something for the worst case scenario and have that? We're, we're working towards, you know, devising a plan that will do just that. Worst case so. scenario is like 200 feet. No, no. It's ten, think it's maybe ten. five meters. It's no, ten. no, 200 feet. I mean, when, when it, the eventual eventuality yeah. is like 200 feet. In another, yeah, another 200 no. years, 300 years, but yeah. yeah. And it'll take about 20 years if we're on an exponential trajectory. That's the problem. 
That you're using linear models of the data. The most recent data that just came out it shifted us from linear models to exponential models. And if you use a radioactive decay model and apply it to ice melting, we're we're it's too late. We're it's already too late, and this is way too little. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start. Let's just start. Yes, sir. Right. Sea level rise, two factors. It's the thermal expansion of water, right. but also the melting of land-based ice. Right. You're taking both of those into account. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Anyone else? You mentioned, you know, the Netherlands and their yes. technology. <laughs> Same thing happened in New Orleans. Why aren't we just doing that? Um, I think political will. Yeah, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. So um, this woman said, well, you mentioned the Netherlands and, you know, what they're designing to. We've seen what's happened um, with Hurricane Katrina and with um, New Orleans and so forth. And why aren't we designing to that? Um, and that's a great question. Uh, and it's kind of hard to answer, I think. But I think political will is part of that. Um, and, and all the influences on that political will are part of that. Um, I do think that that tide is changing, no pun intended. And um, believe it or not, even in red states where these kinds of things have happened, Florida, for example, which I guess Florida's more purple now, but um, they acknowledge these risks and they've seen it. They've seen the impacts, and so they know that the political discourse around does it exist or not is BS, right? Um, I, I don't really know how else to answer your question. I think money's definitely part of it. Um, our standards and codes, you know, like FEMA, 100-year storm. You know, so there's a lot of reform to be had, I think, on all that. I, I want to pose, I, what do you think about that? <laughs> Do you have any thoughts or no? Why aren't we, why, what is, why aren't we, why don't we have the standards that are more protective? In our city. Or larger scale. I mean, uh, in our city, we, we are subject to, you know, California code. And we can go beyond, but it, it's, it's a challenge. You have to do cost effectiveness studies, mm -hmm. and if, it, if the, if the, code that you want to implement that's more stringent isn't cost effective, you can't do it. So, what else? So I guess I'd take a stab at that. Um, if, if you look at the, uh, the economic backdrop of cities and counties in our state, uh, many of them are facing deficits for uh, influences that are beyond their control and contracts and obligations to retired employees. So it, it sets a, an economic landscape in which an aggressive investment in infrastructure um, surrounding which there's only a probability, not 100% certainty, let's say that worst case will come true, um, difficult, difficult to, you know, as a, as a group, as, a, as, a, as a, say, a group of elected council members to, to move forward with because there's, there's a, sh there may, like in our own city, there's a tremendous shortfall that we have uh, through this uh, coming decade, actually. So, so that's a, that's sort of a, uh, well, it's, it's sort of a toxic cocktail, isn't it? In other words, we see, we, we see uh, high probabilities of scenarios and, uh, of natural events in which we've never experienced in our lives and in the scale <coughs> that we can really only imagine and, and develop probabilities around. And yet our, our resources at a uh, municipal level are, are perhaps the most uh, impacted that we've ever seen in our lives since World War II, I would say, certainly. So uh, it, it, it's, I, I don't have a solution, but what I'm, I'm trying to do is recount and talk a little bit about uh, fiscally, historically, where we are, and then as a species, as Californians, as Santa Cruzans, uh, as, as scientists, as people looking at and trying to forecast what the probabilities of certain uh, undesirable events that may occur are so that we can then act on infrastructure. And so I think that's the very challenging uh, landscape and backdrop that we're all working and challenged with. Yeah, and I'll follow up on that. Part of these resilient coast projects that I talked about is how are we going to pay for this? We have, they, we need 
to know what are the funding strategies, what do we need, who pays, you know, who pays to protect all of this stuff. That's part of these projects. I mean, I know it's a little tangential to your question, you know, and I'll just bring up another point about the dysfunction of some of our federal agencies that set some of these standards. I mean, we see FEMA coming in and rebuilding in the same areas. It's <laughs> ludicrous, right? But then on the other hand, we have seen FEMA fund buyout programs for people to get out of the areas that are, you know, so we have this, this mismatch of, of policy and, and action that's happening at the federal level, which we rely upon FEMA funds for many things. Um, I'm going to be applying for a FEMA grant for some of this work soon, um, some next step uh, of this work. But you're all highlighting really real issues that I wish I had better answers for. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I know you've had your hand up. I'll give you. Do you mind if she goes? Is that okay? Um, I mean, it's just it's a world problem, and, it's, it's a, and but we have maybe control of the United States, so we need to elect our national leaders and representatives that will put emission reductions first priority. Yes, absolutely, and I'm sure you all know that we have a climate suit against 29 fossil fuel companies for that very reason, so that perhaps we could have an abatement fund to fund some of these mm -hmm. impacts that they themselves have admitted in their own internal documentation to have caused. Ma'am, in the back, I want to back to you. Them go. Oh, okay, go ahead. Um, I read recently about carbon sequestering and building materials, like um, concrete, and that um, municipalities can support that by setting building standards that require negative emissions, not just reduction of emissions. Mm -hmm. Do we have any research or any movement in that direction? Not that I know, but it, this actually comes under Kurt's area. Do you, do you want to? So, so, so your question is general, our, our city, our county, our state? Uh, our our maybe, city, maybe. our county. So, I mean, so, so our state renews its building standards, one of which is the energy code, every three years. And it's you know, it's based on other codes that are of international threat. And our, our state is really leading our nation in terms of uh, the reduction of the energy use of buildings. Uh, but, there, but we could be acting more aggressively as they are in, in Western Europe. <coughs> there are approaches to creating ultra-efficient buildings that are very cost-effective that will you know, even significantly reduce buildings beyond what the California code is demanding. Uh, that are cost effective. And uh, you know, Tiffany and I are actually uh, working, uh, we've, we've had some things we're not prepared to discuss right now, but we're working on that. Um, now, your, your question was, well, what, you know, what, are we, what are we doing? So well, in our city, in our city, our city has a program which was created uh, in the last decade, just after you know, Al Gore's film, The Inconvenient Truth, and our council created a green building program that really looks at all the life cycle impacts, the longevity of buildings. I mean, wood frame construction is carbon that we've taken out of the atmosphere in the form of those wood framing members. So we want that building to last as long as possible. So it's not just the uh, life cycle impacts, the environmental impact during construction, but once it's in place, lasting a long time. So uh, other cities actually look to us and are interested in our program. Um, but, you know, our, our city is, is doing quite a bit, and that there's some other cities that are looking at ways they can reach beyond the California code. Uh, our city's not currently actively pursuing that for energy, but does that kind of answer your question? Well, I was just curious if you knew about this, these um, companies that are, are generating building aggregate, like c concrete, that sequester carbon, so take it out of the atmosphere. Right. So I'm, I'm aware of, there's, there's actually some companies that are close to our city. Um, when I've asked for that company's life cycle analysis on that particular product, uh, it's still forthcoming. So, uh, you know, so if, I, if, I'm in, if I'm in a position in government to suggest an approach, I need to make sure there's a rigorously peer-reviewed study yeah. before I, I got uh, before it. So this is still too new. That. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. I, I will say I will say that if you're pouring concrete, there is now the ability to use steel slag with fly ash. And because steel is recycled in our country all over the place, you're not uh, transporting the fly ash from the central part of the country with a lot of coal-fired power plants. So that, you know, and that's just one example of a building material that uh, will will use less uh, concrete. Okay, is that green. Calera concrete, that, uh, the company that you're talking about? <laughs> uh, maybe we should. I don't. I don't want to take time away from the other. Well, you know, we can, I can. I can give you my card. You call. guys can definitely chat. We're actually over time, so I just want to say thank you. I'm happy to stay and answer any other questions that people might have. Thank you so much. I do appreciate your questions. Thanks for being involved.